Welcome to Collegial Conversations with Diana Clark, the professional webinar series that offers clinical and personal perspectives on issues that are common, but often not talked about. Here is today's Collegial Conversation. Hi, and welcome to Collegial Conversation. Today's guest is Dr. Joshua Coleman, He is the author of many books, one of which I have sitting next to me, When Parents Hurt. And we're going to be talking today about parental estrangement and, frankly, on, I hope, to tease out both sides of that equation. Sometimes it is the parents and sometimes it is the kids. And I'd love to discuss, first of all, the first question I have is, how do you define estrangement? And welcome. I'm sorry, I'm always ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. Um, let's do because, you know, different people define it different way. And it's one of the problems with the research is that it gets defined in so many different ways. I generally think of, of estrangement as a situation where it's either a complete cutoff or something close to a cutoff or there's so much ongoing conflict that it makes any kind of a reasonable relationship untenable. But most of the parents who contact me, their adult children have almost little to no contact with them. And that's typically the population I'm working with. Yeah. I've received a couple of those calls and and I have to say they break my heart. Her, her. They, they don't seem, the parents who call me do not seem like parents who have committed the kind of parenting failures we would anticipate for a child to do a cutoff. Well, I think that's really a hugely important point for two reasons. One is that a lot of parents don't talk about it if they're strange because they assume that people are going to feel like, well, you must have done something pretty terrible for your kid to cut off contact with you. So they don't talk about it, but then they don't get support and they feel more socially isolated. Um, I mean, the reality is some parents realistically do do terrible things. And it's it's easy to understand whether an adult child could or would. But to your point, a lot of them don't. It's just sort of random good luck or bad luck. Their kid marries somebody who says, choose them or me, you can't have both. Or they have a mental health crisis. Or they need to blame their parent for how their lives turned out. Or they get involved with a therapy who assumes everything is caused by a childhood trauma. And that person encourages them to estrange themselves. Or they don't know any other way to feel separate from the parent than to cut themselves off from the parent. So, so no, it's, it isn't just really terrible parents who get estranged these days. So I want to tease out the second to last reason that you just talked about, mm-hmm. that it might be the only way kids are individuating right now because of the availability of so much contact. Yeah. No, I th- something I think a lot about, you know, I've grew up in Dayton, Ohio in the 60s, moved out here in the late 70s here being the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a terrible place to live. Terrible. <laughs> it's just awful. Um, but I was thinking, you know, when I moved out here, I mean, I wasn't sending my parents daily, hourly updates of how I was doing or pictures or Maybe I called them like maybe when I land, you know, arrived and I drove, um, you know, maybe a week later. I mean, there just there wasn't the sort of opportunity for them to be all in my business and surveilling and being worried and wondering and all of that. And I I feel sorry in a certain sense for the way that um, we've just become way too available to our children and our children to us. And so they so some estrangements really do seem to me to just be a way to feel separate and to just feel some sense of themselves without the parents' interventions or opinions or feelings or any of that. So I think I have an image of the kids just going back (laughs) up, leave me alone for a little while. Right. I think that's very common. And I think they have a much harder time getting it. Then the parent gets their feelings hurt if they don't, you know, return a text right away. And I know what that feels like. I have adult children. It's like, I texted you a day ago. How come you haven't responded? You know, it sort of invites the parent to feel hurt or to make more of it than really is. It's just sort of bad for everybody in that sense. I mean, it's great if it all works out, if people are in the same level of contact, everybody wants to be. But if the adult child doesn't want that much contact, then it's kind of, it's terrible for them. So let's talk for a second. We can talk about trauma and there are parents who have done horrible things. When would you advocate to a kid it's time to create a life without that parent in yeah. under what circumstances? Yeah, I don't know that I would ever 
advocate it per se. Um, I guess I see my role in these situations more as a consultant in helping them to to weigh the good and the bad and the you know the potential consequences to them and to the parents. Um, you know, in the same way that I think parents have to do due diligence in their adult children's complaints. I think they have to show empathy, take responsibility. Uh, find the curl of truth, if not the bushel of truth. I think adult children do owe it to their parents to give them a period of time where they work on the relationship, where they tell them what they need, what's problematic about their parenting, give the parents the opportunity to change, maybe to do their own therapy or family therapy. But I do think if a parent, you know, remains unrepentant, continues to, you know, criticize the person's sexuality or gender identity or who they're married to or their career choices, and it's just constantly in this position of shaming and rejecting and humiliating the child, it's hard to encourage an adult child to keep going back for more of that. So I think those are situations where I would find myself feeling like, yeah, you're paying too high of a price for this relationship. I wouldn't say, therefore, you should cut them off. But if they were to say that, um, first of all, I'd want to make sure they'd done due diligence. But if they had, then I would certainly be sympathetic to that decision. Yeah. I would also wonder you know, I think particularly young adults look at all or nothing solutions. I'm cutting them off for the rest of my life. The idea that maybe we promote or not promote, but entertain the idea of mid solutions. Yeah. These really, really chaotic and fraught moments to say, yeah, take your time. That's yeah. It is an adult. I like the concept of mid solutions. I haven't heard of that, but that seems that seems like a creative way to think about it. You don't have to commit to this for the rest of your life. Give it six months or a year. I sometimes tell parents who are keep trying and trying and getting nothing back, hey, take a year break. Give your kids the space to do it. I mean, that's sort of an example. You're not you don't have to say you're never gonna try with your kid again. But yeah, a mid solution, I think it's a really creative way to to think about these things. Because the idea that communication is the only time people are doing their individual work and working on a relationship is a fallacy. We do more on a relationship without being in touch in that scenario. No, absolutely. I call it parenting at a distance. You know, so many parents are like, but I want to help. I want to, you know, my kid's suffering. I want to help them. I want to hear how they're doing. I want them to know what I'm doing. And sometimes the best thing we can offer our children is the ability to just feel completely separate and not think about it, particularly since parenting has so much changed so much in the past four decades. We become much more involved, much more anxious, much more guilt-ridden, much more worried about launching our kids. And so we become much more intrusive. I mean, in my generation, parents in particular, fathers, if they made a mistake, it was that they weren't involved enough. You know, in our generation, they, they you know, I'm guessing you're probably within a decade or two of me. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe a, a minute or two older. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to tell. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, I think we've made the mistake of being kind of too involved, too available, too caring, and too concerned. So having a period of time where they just don't have to think about us can be very, very useful for them. And it's still a form of parenting. It's giving them something that they need. It's just we're not getting anything back in the moment. Right. Yeah. I remember when I had a son, I was in my 40s, so I was a late mom, and a friend of mine who'd already launched kids said to me, you have two jobs. I can boil this down for you, Diane. I was like, thank God. <laughs> and that the first one was that you just love him just because he breathes, just for who he is. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I can do that. Totally got and it. she said, second one is to make sure he can function without you. Mm, it's a good, good advice. And that one is what's kicking ass right now. Yeah. <laughs> we are not doing the second job. No. So when I was growing up, it was really incumbent upon me, right? To mm. prove my worth, my value to my parents. Right. Exactly. That's flipped. It's totally flipped. Yeah. It used to be the, the child's job to earn the parents' love. Now it's the parents' job to earn the child's love. And that's, that's a huge... Uh, it, it is a huge problem. And I think you're putting your finger on this issue of parental worry, which is really, you know, doesn't, doesn't bring confidence in our children. It kind of puts them, makes them worried. If we're constantly worrying about their future and their capacities and their ADD or their learning disabilities or their depression or their anxiety, we're inviting them to be worried about it too. Whereas 
you know, in my parents' generation, I mean, I, I'm blessed. I had really nice, loving parents, but they just weren't all in my business in that way, in the way that, you know, I was with my kids. And I think our generation has been everyone since then. And they would have been a hot mess if they knew what I was up to. They really would have. They didn't need to know. You know, there were times when I was probably making really foolish, life-threatening decisions. And if I had a phone to be able to say, Mom, Mom I'm hitchhiking between Denver and Boulder, <laughs> that would have created a different parenting relationship with me. Yeah. No, I think it's really, really true. Um, my father, who served in the Navy, is he was like debrief people who came off the battlefield. So he, he was very interested in psychology. So we, we used to talk a lot about it. And I used to have a fear when I was little of being lost. And so as I got to be a little bit older, he did this kind of exposure program with me long before there was exposure. We'd go to a you know, big hockey game and he'd say, okay, I want you to go get the popcorn. You know, I want you to pay attention to where we are. You have to go through this crowded stadium and go get the popcorn and then come back. And and then all, later when I was a teenager, I wanted to hitchhike to, to, wow. to, to Manhattan to see my girlfriend. I was 17 and he supported it. And, you know, I mean, I would have never supported that with my kids. I would have probably been very worried if my kids had wanted to get popcorn by themselves when they were nine or whatever. So, you know, I just think there was a separation of uh, generations that was very useful to us back then that, that has really gotten kind of uh, merge in ways that's not good for anybody. So do you think the shift happened in part because we did want more from our parents though? I think that's certainly part of it. I think we've all been in therapy. We've all been, you know, reviewing the mistakes our parents made. We've had these ideas of, oh, if we had gotten this, we wouldn't have that. I think that's part of it. I think that the economy has made parents feel like um, they have to work super hard. There's good research in economics that shows that in high social inequality countries like the U.S. and China and the U.K., parents work much harder because they can't, they can't really trust that once their kids are adult, they're going to be able to launch an adulthood. Whereas in low, low social inequality countries like Sweden or Japan or the Scandinavian countries or Germany, they know that, you know, even if they don't graduate with a good degree, there's be a good paying union job or healthcare, or, you know, education is free or inexpensive. Whereas in the U.S., everything is on the parents. So it makes parents these hot messes because we're also anxious about getting our kids into some kind of formal, stable adulthood. It's very problematic. Yeah. So back to estrangement, that can lead, I can see where that leads to estrangement. Yeah. What are sort of the rules or the guidelines if you are estranged from a child or, or a parent? I think the first thing is to seek to understand. I think it's human nature as a parent to want to defend and to explain and to remind the child of all the good things that you did for them. But that that always backfires. If your kid is estranged, they've drawn a very strong line in the sand where they're saying, no, actually you really messed up in some significant way. And so it's incumbent on the parent to try to understand. And they do that through showing empathy and interest and not being defensive and repairing and finding the kernel of truth, if not the bushel of truth. I always have parents write a letter of amends where they basically either address what the child has said. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> not to defend themselves, and not to explain why they did it, just to say, yeah, these are my, these are, I could see why that was hurtful to you or problematic or any of those things. Oh, dear. Yes. Oh, yeah. I used to use a letter of resignation that <laughs> would read something like, dear Odysseus, I now realize that my behavior and attitude towards you and your launching, well-being, whatever the adject, the other, the event is, have not always been helpful. Therefore, I resign from the following. Being preoccupied with your problems, trying to control you, caretaking you, worrying constantly about you, protecting you from the consequences of your actions, snooping in your life, shaming or blaming you, walking on eggshells around you, assuming responsibility for your well-being. Mm -hmm. I get this letter to you is a gift for both you and me so you can manage your life and I can manage mine. My wish is we both have full ones. I love you. That's so it. I see that as an act of love. Yeah. Well, isn't that not sentence, but to live it, to right. live it. 
Yeah, yeah. The living it is the hard part, right? Uh, Not send it. Don't send that. Live no, it. That's good. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. some problems, but yeah. No, 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 no. no. That's good to do. Right. For yours. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, what I call making the distinction between self dialogue and what you say to your child. They're often very different. It's fine to say to yourself, look, I was a really great parent. I made all kinds of sacrifices for you. Or the other parent, you know, is a bigger problem than you're acknowledging. Or it's your new spouse or, you know, that's actually the problem or your mental illness or whatever. You can say all those things to yourself. You just can't say them to your kid. To your kid, you have to be in a position of empathy and understanding and being open to to the negative feedback. And we all have blind spots as parents. So you have to be, have some humility around that. Yeah. I have always made it clear that I would pay for therapy yeah. for the reason that I know I'm a very flawed mother. We, as we all are. That's just, just the territory. Yeah. yeah. A wounded healer, as they call that, you know, so yeah. my own ones. Yeah. Can we talk a minute about fit kids? fit with parents because i think that's something we don't talk about because we get so caught in blame yeah. let's talk about fit a little bit yeah no i think it's an interesting topic and one that that i probably don't talk about enough you know in the same way that sometimes siblings get along better because of a, a fit which may be partly genetic you know dispositional um but i think i think to your point that can also happen with parents that you might have a parent say who's very um you know, anxious and withdrawn and introverted and a kid who's very extroverted and aggressive and oppositional, and they just don't understand each other. And so there's this constant dialogue, and, I mean, not dialogue, constant tension and, and conflict and feelings of rejection and hurt that can come from that. Um, so I think fit is important. I think it's not unusual uh, for somebody to get married and feel like, well, their in-laws fit better with them. And so they get kind of migrated to that family, which is very hurtful to the biological parents if there's a, uh, an estrangement. So I think the topic of fit can be really um, profound in lots of ways. So fit. I remember hearing that concept with when my son was little, he had a friend who he had been in preschool with and then elementary school with. And then when he was about six or seven, I they had a play date and I said, how is blank? And he said, well, we don't fit right now. <laughs> I thought, what a nice way, right? Yeah, it's very insightful way to put it. Just don't fit. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's impressive. I know. I thought that, but I don't think it was because he was skilled that way i think he genuinely saw yeah something that way image yeah no i think it's a very common problem with various family members parents and adult children their siblings um so no i think it's it's not at all unusual that, that can be an issue do you think generations ago parents expected to like their children or that children expected to like their parents not in the same way. You know, there was a study done out of the University of Virginia that showed that a majority of parents today hope and expect to be best friends with their children over the life course. And that's an enormous amount of pressure to put on a child or on yourself, because if you're not having it, then you feel like a failure uh, and you feel rejected by your kid if you're not getting it. So, no, I don't think so. I think the task of parenting has, has really uh, escalated enormously where parents are not only supposed to like become best friends with their kids, they're supposed to create happy children who are sort of resilient and can take on any challenge in life. And it's problematic because then the children look back on their childhoods and say, well, I'm not happy now. So you must've done something really bad. You know, there must've been some way you traumatized me that, you know, if you hadn't done that, then my life would be great. But no, I don't, I don't think that uh, prior generations were so preoccupied with that. And part of it is that, you know, relationships in general, they become much more unstable and uncertain. So our relationships with our kids may be the one relationship that we can hope to have uh, in a more permanent way, because you can't really count on marriage. You know, people are moving all the time. Friendships seem more, more fragile than they once were. Employers are far less committed to their employees. So everything's kind of becoming what Alison Pugh, the sociologist, calls like tumbleweed society. It's like, you know, kind of this root, rootlessness. And I think that characterizes family relations as well. And where does wealth come in here? Because I think that, you know, if we're talking about the ability to be a tumbleweed, that requires a certain amount of means. Where does wealth come in? Yeah. I mean, the way I think of it is that there's sort of two poles, like on the wealthy side, I think there's research to show that 
wealthier um, um, adult children and parents think of uh, that whatever they they achieve, it's because of their own strengths uh, and traits. And I think that that can make them be more harsh in their judgment of the parent, kind of like, I don't owe you anything, you know, whatever I've achieved in my life, no matter what your sacrifices were, I don't owe you anything. Uh, whereas in the working class and the poor, um, there's, there's sort of a way that they've kind of been co-opted by this more um, neoliberal ideology of, you know, it's all within you to, to, to solve their problems. And so the families become much more important in that because there's this idea that now they have to liberate themselves from dysfunctional families. Both sides kind of have that therapeutic narrative in mind in ways that I think is really problematic and sort of for, for different, they arrive there in different ways, but they sort of end up having, saying many of the same kinds of things. So you mentioned something about happy it is one of my soapboxes. I have to say when my son was little and he came over and he said, I'm not happy and you don't care. And I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, the feeling it comes and goes. Go <laughs> play outside. <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> right? Well, this quest for happy actually is, I think, making all of us a bit unstable. I don't think those are terms of life. They're not, and it's it's sort of the wrong compass to to live your life by. And uh, the historian Peter Stearns who talks about, you know, when. When, when the idea that children were bored became the parents' problem and not the child's problem, that was a, that was a problem. I mean, that, like you, I mean, if I were young and I would, a child, I'd tell my mother I was bored, she'd go, well, you can either help me like clean the house or you can go outside and play. <laughs> but you would not say that unless you wanted a chore. Right, exactly, right. So, but in our generation, at least, you know, mine and I think practically, I think you were, I like your response probably better than mine might have been, which might have been to sort of see it as some problem that required parental intervention. Um, yeah, no, I think that, that, that the orientation towards happiness is really problematic because it also minimizes the importance of other things like duty and responsibility and loyalty and obligation and all these things that the field of psychology. Purpose. And purpose. Right, right, which requires sacrifice and working through difficult feelings. And yeah, no, I think happiness is a very problematic concept. I mean, you know, nice work if you can get it, but you're just not going to be able to to get it a lot of the time. So what are you how are you thinking about your life when you're not? And what's the easiest way to get to happy? Spending, substance use, sex, all of the compulsive behaviors yeah, that right. elevate dopamine, but they don't create a meaningful life. No, they don't. No, it's 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 relationships. It's your ability to be close to people and have meaningful engagement with people or meaningful work. And you know, Freud said it's work, work and love. And he wasn't far off of that. But Freud wasn't very oriented towards happiness either. Freud didn't. He said something like, "It's not, you know, the mission of humanity to make themselves happy or something like that." But he was basically uh -huh. he knew that happiness was sort of the wrong, you know, compass to guide your life. But right, absolutely. Well, if you had one single piece of advice to parents out there or kids out there that were struggling in their relationship that, that considered themselves estranged, what would that advice be? I mean, for the parent, it's, you know, it's just try to show compassion and empathy and take responsibility and try to find the kernel of truth in the child's complaints. For the adult child, um, it's to try to... Um, know that your parent did the best they could, even if the best that they could was really problematic, that whatever mistakes they made with you, it wasn't because they actually wanted you to suffer. And from that perspective, they deserve some degree of, of empathy or the opportunity to work on the relationship or salvage the relationship um, to kind of do a, a due diligence on both sides would really be my, my best advice. I like it. Well, thank you, Dr. Coleman. I appreciate you being here today. Yeah, it was fun. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you for joining this webinar. Tune in to more webinars and sign up for our newsletter at O'ConnorPG.com.